blessings one and all and welcome to the mystic fire i'm paul james caden and today i would like to talk to you briefly about letting the light of the resurrection shine in your life this is certainly a very peculiar easter season that we're having most of us are in quarantine we're not gathering with our family members and our friends we're not going to church services if we celebrate, if we happen to be religious or spiritual. And even those of us who look at this as more of a secular holiday, a lot of people aren't going to be seeing their loved ones and having the usual Easter dinner and the gathering around the table. Some of us will be Skyping in our loved ones for some kind of celebration or FaceTime during the holiday. But it has a very peculiar feeling to it this year. We, we've, never, we've never faced anything like this in our lives. This, this is a brand new situation that we're looking at, and it's, it's very bizarre, and there are some people that are in complete denial. There are some people that just want to push through and say, well, I'm going to have my church services, I'm going to have my Easter dinner and gather with my family and my loved ones anyway. I, I would say this uh, at this moment, um, try not to do that. You know, if someone is sick in your family or your congregation, you're only going to endanger the health, the well-being, and possibly the lives of people that you care about. And that's not what we should be doing on Resurrection Sunday. We should be selfless instead of selfish. We need to think ahead a little bit to Ponder the rest of the year, 4th of July, Labor Day, Christmas, Thanksgiving, the holidays that lay ahead next Easter. We want our loved ones and our fellow parishioners to celebrate with us then. We don't want to lose anybody because of foolishness or boredom right now. So please think about that as you're getting ready to celebrate however you're celebrating this year the Easter season if you truly want to have an Easter service or remember Christ maybe set something up in your home light some candles get some bread and grape juice and take communion together Skype in your family members and your friends have a time of prayer have a time of contemplation of what the death and resurrection and ascension of Christ means to you, literally, metaphorically, metaphysically, spiritually, however you want to contemplate it. This is something that my wife and I have been doing all of this Holy Week because we celebrate. And it was something we were doing by ourselves, we do it every year, but we, we had, uh, you know, some relatives that uh, came in via Skype. They wanted to participate, and it, it was really a wonderful little gathering, just everyone having their their bread, their wine, their bread and juice, lighting some candles, saying the prayers, and then just talking about what these rituals, what these rites, what this death and resurrection of Christ means to them. So those moments can be just as meaningful right there in your own home than they can in a big church somewhere. So there's ways you can make this meaningful for yourself because that's what it's all about. This is about your relationship with God, your relationship with Christ, your understanding of spirituality and how you celebrate and how you relate to the divine. 
So there are certainly ways to make it meaningful and to make it have depth right where we are right now. And speaking of where we are right now, it is a dark time in our world. There are a lot of people dying. There are a lot of people sick. We can't go to the grocery store or, you know, we can't go out anywhere without wearing a mask or worrying if other people are going to be mindful and, uh, you know, sanitary when they're in public. Many people are not. So it's a very anxiety-inspiring situation to be in. There are people that are losing their lives in New York City the last couple days. It's been seven, eight hundred people a day. So it it is certainly a, a very sad and a very dark time in our history. But I think also, in the face of all of that, we we need to contemplate Christ in the tomb and then the morning of the resurrection. Because that's what those stories, that's what those symbols, that's what the mission of Christ was all about. Death, resurrection, new life, spiritual life. And this is something that I talked about last night during our time of prayer and communion uh, via Skype with our loved ones. Is that when you think about all of these people that have passed away, people that have lost loved ones, we often look at it as being this final and eternal goodbye. They're gone. We'll never see them again. They're no longer in this world. They're no longer here with us. But we can look beyond that to the moment of the empty tomb. The moment when Christ comes out of the darkness. we can begin to ponder that this world is not all that there is. There is life beyond all of this. And I did a show on my other podcast, The Spirit Side, where I talked about the near-death experiences, where many people, and this is something that I've studied for uh, a very long time, since probably uh, the early 90s, I used to have uh, a very, because of the way I was raised and uh, many of my relatives were so fearful of death and disease. When I was a kid, even, you know, into a teenager and a young man, uh, I, I was very much afraid to die, though I was a spiritual person. And I began to try to overcome that fear. And I did. And one of the ways I did this was studying the near death experience. And it's something I still study today. I, I look into it. I I see uh, what the new findings are. And just to make a long story short, I know that there's a lot of people that say, well, the tunnel that we see, it's just the dying brain, the brain being starved of oxygen. We see what looks like this pinpoint of light that gets bigger and bigger. Well, it's all explained through science. But as I said in my other podcast, there are doctors and scientists and quantum physicists and people of all walks of life in the scientific community who have either had a near-death experience or seen enough people have them in their career that they actually left mainstream science and joined or started these institutions that study exclusively the near-death experience and the survival of consciousness after death. And one of the things, one of the phenomenon that the dying brain hypothesis doesn't touch on is the phenomenon when somebody has a near-death experience 
and they find themselves outside of the body. And they'll think about their loved ones, my husband, my wife, my parents, my kids, or whomever it might be. And they say suddenly they find themselves in the presence of that person, whether they're in the waiting room, waiting you know, for them to come out of surgery, or whether they're at home at the moment, and they see exactly what that person is doing, what exactly it is they're saying, that they're wearing, what happens the moment they get the phone call from the hospital that says, you should come right away, we don't think your father or your mother is going to make it. But then the person does make it. They, they're resuscitated, they go back into the body, they wake up, they live to tell about it. And they've seen from miles away or out in the waiting room somewhere in the hospital exactly what people were doing at that moment that they died and left their body. Now, there's a scientific term for that that they have. I don't remember exactly what it is, but this is a very widespread phenomenon in the near-death experience. So how would we explain that? Suddenly a dying brain has massive ESP and the, the um, ability to do uh, very skilled and detailed remote viewing. I mean, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So we do have, and, and there are other things attached to the near-death experience that are just unexplainable when it comes to the dying brain theory. So we do have some evidences. We do have some glimpses that seem to tell us, yes, there is life beyond this life, as Dr. Raymond Moody said in one of his books, or, or entitled one of his books, which is Life After Life. And Raymond Moody was a doctor who uh, became fascinated with near-death experiences. He never really believed in any of this sort of thing, but he saw so many of them, he, he wrote a whole host of books about this phenomenon and, and studied it up until I think he's passed away now, but there certainly does seem to be a lot of clues and hints and glimpses that there is life beyond life. And that's something when we think about the resurrection, the empty tomb, we can think about our loved ones who may have passed away and in a sense, they're in the empty tomb. Their body may be in the grave. But them, the person, their consciousness, their spirit, their soul, if you will, is somewhere else, alive and well, conscious and existing. And that's amazing to me to think about that when you hear about the story of the resurrection, and for most of us it's been just that, a story that we believed in or had faith in, but now we have evidences, scientific evidences and glimpses that there is a, a resurrection, a rising of the consciousness to a new dimension of life after we leave this world. And so when I say, let the light of the resurrection shine in your life today, I would like to invite each and every one of you, each and every one of us to ponder these things during this Easter season. What does it mean if there is life beyond life? What does it mean if the things Christ told us about a world and a kingdom beyond this world that he was from. And it truly exists. What does that mean for our life? How we live our lives? How we now begin to view life around us? How does it change our perception of what's going on 
right now in our world. Because we seem to put ourselves in such a tiny box in this world. We get up, we go to work, or we go to school, we come home, we eat dinner, we watch TV, we play on our, you know, our phones, we're always texting, we're playing games online, and then we go to bed, and then we get up and we do it all over again. And we say, this is life. And now everybody, the thing that I've really noticed now that everyone's on lockdown, everybody wants to be outside of that box. They want to be outside. They want to see their loved ones. They want to see their friends. They want to have human interaction. And before all this happened, everyone was complaining that there was no human interaction anymore. But now that that's taken away, at least temporarily, Everybody wants it. Everybody understands and sees and knows what they've been missing. So maybe during this Easter Sunday, let's look a little deeper, a little further outside the box. And maybe realize what we have been missing by not having that spiritual element in our lives. Not having faith, not having hope not having the idea that there's more than this. There's more beyond this. There's life beyond this. What we do matters now. And when we contemplate life beyond life, what kind of hope, what kind of strength does that give us? To say, come what may in this world, I'm going to be okay. It's going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Because it looked so help, so helpless and so or so hopeless and so defeating when Christ was put in the tomb. But what a miracle it was when he came out and then ascended into the heavens. That's not only Christ's story, but it's our story as well. And when we really contemplate that in or through the eyes of that there is some scientific data now being discovered that we're all going to make that ascension eventually and inevitably. How does that change this little box, this little life that we put ourselves in or allowed society to put us in? When we contemplate those things, that is letting the light of the resurrection shine in our lives. I hope you've gotten something positive out of this little message today. I hope it brought some light and joy and hope into your Easter celebration. Please remember to be safe and take the life and health and well-being of other people into consideration this Easter season. And I'll see you next time here on the Mystic Fire. God bless everyone. Happy Easter.